suspect will likely be right back out on the street immediately. Now, I spoke with eyewitness Cody Crippen, who caught that shocking moment on camera. Cody Crippen was there. He joins us now to explain what he saw. Cody, first off, thanks for being with us. Tell us what you saw last night. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, last night was really just kind of crazy, honestly, from seeing it happen all in front of me. Um, I was just honestly in the area driving by and uh, I just decided to go and check it out. And to be honest with you, it was just, you know, a normal, I guess, uh, you know, rally or whatever you would call it. And, uh, you know, things were just fine, you know, nothing really out of the ordinary. Um, and then I just randomly, I decided to start recording and, um, randomly we see this guy come off to the left side of the stage from where I was, uh, standing. And he kind of just walks up to the, uh, governor candidate Zeldin and says, all right, you know, you're done, you know? And, uh, at that point, people had realized, you know, oh, he had some sort of, um, w w it looked like, um, like a brass knuckle sharpened, uh, keychain of some sort. But immediately, you know, people started realizing. And, uh, at that point, a couple people had jumped, um, on top of them. I was still just recording, uh, I, you know, just watching. And, uh, at that point, uh, you know, he actually got taken down to the ground uh, by the guy who, uh, you know, was trying to attack him. And, uh, you know, thankfully, a lot of people jumped in. Um, I know a lot of people were just moving towards uh, the little stage there they had set up. And then at one point there was uh, people were saying, oh, he's got a gun or he somebody mentioned something. So there's a, kind of a panic. And then you know, people started to clear out, um, but uh, you know, it, it, people had zip ties, so they managed to subdue him, uh, zip tie him. I know a bunch of us just kind of went forward and, uh, you know, just were ready to jump in if need be, if, you know, more people needed to, uh, restrain him, but it was just kind of a chaotic scheme. So did you by chance see anything lead up to this? I know you had your phone out and you were recording beforehand, um, but did you see the man before he pulled out this uh, reports are saying that it's a blade or was that the first time you had seen him walk up to the stage like that? So that was really the first time I saw him go up to the stage. Uh, I didn't see him really before that. He just kind of walked up to the stage, uh, you know, had uh, it was like a spiked brass knuckle keychain that looked like, uh, you know, honestly a cat, you know, it's kind of one of those weird looking things, but, uh, you know, he had it between his two fingers and he walked up and he kind of, you know, just poked at, uh, the governor, uh, candidates chest that looked like, and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of people jumped in at that point. I know his, uh, I believe his lieutenant governor is a former police officer. She uh, she jumped in and took care of the situation. So I bet a lot of people were glad she was there tonight. <laughs> right. And Cody, in the video that you took, it was obvious that after it happened, the crowd was a little stirred up. What was the mood like following in those moments after? And what was really the chatter that you heard amongst the crowd once he was taken away? Um, you know, really the mood was just kind of, everybody was just kind of in shock that it happened. Uh, you know, this is really a small town, not much goes on here. Uh, I know you get more towards the city and whatnot, you get more crime, but not, not too much goes on here. And, uh, you know, everybody was just kind of a little shocked and I think, uh, you know, just surprised to see it happen. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think it really changed the mood from just kind of excited to, you know, just going and, uh, you know, kind of from an upbeat to a panicked and uh, chaotic scene in a matter of seconds, I'd say. Right. And were the people around you, could you tell that they were scared and really were you scared after you found out what happened? Um, 
to be honest with you, it, it you know, some people were getting worried. Some people were just looked like they were kind of in shock. Um, I, I, truthfully, I think, you know, just the right people were there. A lot of people reacted very quickly and prevented the situation from getting worse because it very easily could. I mean, he, he was so close to the guy and, you know, just poking at somebody with a, you know, a weapon like that, it's never a good thing. So I, I think it could have gone horribly wrong. Um, I think, you know, given the situation, I think it was the best possible outcome. You know, nobody was seriously injured. So. Okay. Cody Crippen with his firsthand account of what happened last night. We appreciate your time this morning. Meantime, Zeldin's opponent this fall, incumbent Governor Kathy Hochul, tweeting, relieved to hear that Congressman Zeldin was not injured and that the suspect is in custody. I condemn this violent behavior in the strongest terms possible. It has no place in New York. Back to you guys. All right, Ashley, thank you so much. Great job with that interview as well. Thanks. You know, uh, Joey, the sad irony about all this is that uh, Congressman Zeldin's campaign speech was about the crime problem in New York, and he yeah. was talking about how uh, there are too many victims of crime right now. And that's when this guy, his name is David Jabonis, 43 years old. He hops on stage uh, wielding that sharp object that was like sort of like a brass knuckles type thing and tries to stab him. And you heard, uh, you just saw the tweet by Governor Kathy Hochul saying, you know, thank God this guy is in custody. Well, we're now learning that he was immediately released. And I yeah. feel like that is Congressman Zeldin's point in this whole thing. Also, uh, there was an, uh, initially a lot of confusion. The um, AMBATS national director, his name's Joe Cinelli, he said the congressman turned to face him. I thought he was going to just hug him um, and then maybe heckle him or something along those lines. But then the suspect flashed this weapon. Zeldin wrestled him. Cinelli tackled him, took him down. The crowd then got involved, got zip ties. It was really a group effort. Joe Cinelli, by the way, going to be on with us in the 5 o'clock hour. But how about that scene? Yeah, you know, uh, yes, we use the term there's a lot of moving parts. If you watch this video, I think the one thing that I like to take away from it is that Congressman Lee Zeldin was able to protect himself. And I think that's something that everyone in office should consider. If it's just a, a hip pocket class, as we call it, just an opportunity to say to have some sort of reaction if someone physically attacks you. Because we expect our politicians to come shake our hand, look at us eye to eye, and explain to us what they're doing. But that makes them very vulnerable. And we talk about how divided the country is. We talk about this. We talk about that. Gun violence. A lot of things that are really problematic. Politicians can't stop doing the responsibility of meeting with their constituents. And I, I really like or I'm really refreshed, I guess, by the idea that Congressman Zeldin had the opportunity and the training to react. He, the guy came toward, towards him with a sharp object and Congressman Zeldin pushed his hand out of the way. And it's a pretty small action, but it's a really important action. Yeah. It, it saved himself in that way. And I think that um, obviously this is a problem we need to fix, but I don't know that you can fix crazy. They, they have, um, I think the guy we're gonna interview uh, spoke about, yeah. he spoke to the, the attacker when it happened. And he got from it, this attacker may be a veteran and may have mental health issues. And um, you're just going to release them right back out? I know. If, if mental health yeah. is a part of this, which obviously something isn't right. And you that don't was, just attack that was exactly what uh, Congressman Zeldin's uh, speech was all about. It was about the bail reform laws and how yeah. people who commit crimes are immediately released. And then we're learning that this guy was immediately well. released, completely proving the point of how twisted this bail reform system is. I, I don't know under New York law if he he should have been released or not, but also for his own safety. If he was going through a mental health episode, That's should exactly he be monitored? Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, you know, what I hope is uh, we learn from this. That's what I hope. You can't uh, you can't look at something like this and not be concerned just as a citizen, especially as a, as a politician, but I hope that we learn from it and have better protocol. Yeah, and also really quickly, the witness that Ashley spoke to said that uh, people were at the right place at the right time. His running mate, his name, her name is Allison Esposito. She's a 20-year member of the NYPD, and she's the one that grabbed the sharp object out of this guy's hand. And then now there's this political back and forth that's playing.
playing out. The um, New York GOP chairman, his name's Nick Langworthy, he said it's not a coincidence that just hours earlier, Kathy Hochul fanned the flames of hate by directing her supporters to his rally schedule. This is unacceptable conduct yeah. for anyone, let alone the sitting governor. The governor has since condemned this attack in the strongest of terms. I think the bottom line is that, the, I mean, what if this guy had a gun? This could have been um, a much more serious situation. We're so thankful that everybody is okay this morning. Yeah, gun violence is a problem, but violence is not a gun problem. Exactly. All right, to another Fox News alert, President Biden testing COVID-19 despite being double vaccinated and double boosted. And now the White House is sidestepping questions surrounding his health. Griff Jenkins is live in Washington with the latest. Griff, good morning. Good morning, Carly and Joey. Despite a runny nose, fatigue, and occasional dry cough, President Biden released a video just hours after testing positive, saying he's hanging in there and staying busy. White House says the 79-year-old president is now isolating in the residence and zooming into meetings. The diagnosis comes after Biden received the vaccine and two booster shots last year, but the head of the White House COVID response team acknowledged he was administered an antiviral medicine. Pass limit has emergency use authorization for patients who are at high risk for progression to severe disease. Is the president at high risk for progression to severe disease? I believe anybody over the age of 50 uh, is eligible for uh, Paxlovid. The president is above the age of 50. But when the questions turned to where Biden caught the virus, White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre was quick to interrupt the COVID coordinator. Watch. Where exactly was the president infected? Where was he infected? I, I don't think we know. Um, I certainly don't know if you, if you have any thoughts I, on I, it. Look, I, I don't think that, that matters, right? I think what matters is we prepared for this moment. Meanwhile, Vice President Harris is being considered a close contact, but the White House says no changes are being made to her schedule as she tested negative yesterday. This comes as rumors have been swirling. Carly and Joey about her privately meeting with donors and allies for what many think is an eye on 2024. Carly, Joey. All right, Griff Jenkins, live for us. Thank you. Let's bring in Fox News medical contributor, Dr. Jeanette Neshwa. Dr. Neshwa, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what is your current read on the situation, the diagnosis, and what uh, the president and the American people can expect moving forward with this? Sure. So President Biden, he has a team of excellent doctors who are monitoring him closely. He's quadruple vaccinated. He's started on an antiviral medicine, Paxlovid, right away. So I think he's going to be okay. But the lessons that we're learning are do what you can to protect yourself knowing your risk. If you're a high-risk situation and high-risk group if you have underlying medical conditions if you're over the age of 65 if you have a weak immune system then know that you should be vaccinated get your booster if you qualify get tested make sure you see your doctor regularly because we also have medications that can help protect you in advance of COVID for example there's a medicine called Evusheld which can help you if for example if you can't um, you know in induce an immune response from the vaccine itself so that's something that you can learn from your doctor very interesting you know, one thing the White House has done is they're not really answering questions on contact tracing, on where this, where the, uh, the president got infected from. I remember not that long ago, that was a big deal. Are we just beyond that now? As society, is it not important anymore? Kind of, why are they saying, I think the words were specifically, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think I can see how that statement may be misconstrued as careless and, and it doesn't matter. But in, in all actuality, it, it does. I mean, are we saying that other people's lives aren't important? And maybe, who knows? No Knowing who he contracted it from could potentially uh, inhibit the spread to others and save somebody else's life. So I think it's important to know where, where this close contact came from so that we don't see further spread it to other people. What is Paxlovid? There, there are some people who take this antiviral, like Dr. Fauci. Um, they initially start feeling great, they test negative, and then a couple days later, they end up feeling worse and test positive again. Is there, are there any chances that the president's symptoms could ultimately end up getting worse? He could get sicker in the future? Sure. So that's the case. The rebound can happen for some people, but not all. And I would expect you to test positive two days later. A lot of my patients, if they pick up COVID, they're still positive for seven to 10 days later, whether or not they're on Paxlovid or not. So a small amount of my patients, a small number of my patients could potentially still have that rebound, but not everyone. But the beauty of it is we have more medications that we can prescribe now that we weren't able to yeah. two years ago. On top of that antiviral medicine, we also have monoclonal antibody therapies that we can use as a substitute if you're not a candidate for Paxlovid. Mm -hmm. You know, President Biden is not young. 
He, uh, his age kind of puts him at high risk. Yeah. Also, some of his pre-existing conditions, uh, heart disease and uh, being a, I believe he's had a stroke. Um, you know, if Americans are sitting here and they're looking at this, you know, what's the risk to me? Uh, I think we have a thought here that President Biden's actually going to stop taking one of his medications. Let's look oh, at that yeah. real quick. He's on Eliquis and Crestor, cholesterol-lowering medicine, and a blood thinner for his atrial fibrillation, both of which need to be stopped when you take Paxlovid. It's a very uh, standard, common thing that we do when we give people Paxlovid. Um, and you don't need to do anything in those uh, circumstances. Uh, they, they both get stopped for the five days that he's on uh, Paxlovid, and then they get restarted, and it's totally fine and pretty normal practice. So Americans don't need to worry about if they uh, take Paxlovid themselves, that they need to stop taking the medication that's important to them. That's okay? That, that's a good question. It depends on your situation, your underlying medical conditions. With President Biden, he's on this blood thinner called Eliquis. He needs it because he has what's called atrial fibrillation. And without that blood thinner, he can develop a clot in his heart mm. that can go up to his brain and develop a stroke, like you mentioned earlier. So for him, they probably need to just lower that dosage of the Eliquis. He still needs that blood thinner. Um, and then for his cholesterol medicine, that has to be stopped. Otherwise, that can result in kidney failure. So everyone is different. It depends on what medicine you have, your age, your risk, and um, in the most likely outcomes. Uh, also, Dr. Nesh, the majority of people now are vaccinated. And for those who aren't, there are an abundance of therapeutics. Yeah. So as a doctor, uh, what is your concern about COVID deaths right now? It was a huge problem in 2020. What about now? So we're holding steady between three and 400 deaths a day. Most of those deaths, as a matter of fact, more than 80% of them are in those who are over the age of 65, those with a weak immune system. So it's holding steady at around three, 400. But for most Americans, you know, they have mild symptoms or no symptoms symptoms, runny nose, cough, fever, congestion. Most of us do well and, and we, we recover. But, you know, again, we've got vaccines, we've got testing, we've got therapeutics. It's no longer really a death sentence like it was two years ago. And that is very, very good news. Yes. Well, Dr. Jay, thanks for uh, bringing some optimism to us early this morning. You're probably going to go to work and save lives for the rest of the day. So thanks for stopping <laughs> She's by. She's so impressive. <laughs> I can't get enough of you. Thank you, Neshwa, Dr. Neshwa. I appreciate it. Mike, good morning. What are your thoughts on Eileen Gu getting this, this SB award? Award. Yeah, so good morning, Carly. So there's a couple things here. First off, nobody's obviously complaining or saying anything about her athletic ability. Like, she's obviously amazing, won gold medals, all that. But I do have a couple concerns, okay? One is with her herself, her alone, because, you know, there's reports that in order for her to have uh, competed for China to be on their Chinese, you know, Olympic team, that she had to have renounced her American citizenship. And we don't know if that's true or not because she's not talking about it. She's not disclosing that information. So that that right there is kind of a question mark because it's like, listen, you can go do what you want. That's fine. But don't try to hide it. Don't try to cover it up. Just be honest with us because, Carly, this is literally the definition of a sellout. Like, if you're going to enjoy American freedoms and American, you know, everything that we stand for in the country, and then you're going to go and <laughs> go yeah. to China. I know. Like, that is a sellout move right there. Like, what is that? Just, just be honest with us, okay? Like, like you, she's now being used. I wouldn't say as a pawn, but she's being used as a, uh, you know, some sort of not like maybe an icon or whatnot. She's being used by the Communist Party yeah. right now in China rather than America. And you know, Bottom guns. Line. I was, I was reading a reaction from other. Uh, skiers and the thing that it seems to bother them the most is that she became the skier she is today because she is American and she right. benefited from American coaches and facilities and then to see her at the Olympics draped in the Chinese flag with a big smile on her face just you know makes you shake your head yeah. and it also yeah. you also feel kind of sad for her um, because who wouldn't want to be an American used. Olympic darling yeah so why do you think yeah. she ultimately made the decision that she did I mean, she's got, she made over, she made tens upon tens of millions of dollars in endorsement deals before she even competed at the Olympics in China. So maybe there's a financial incentive. What I would have liked her to have done, Carly, is, you know, she, she's talked in the past about Chinese, uh, Chinese Americans and how it's hard and there's biases against them, et cetera. Why not compete in America then? Why not be an icon or role model for all those young Chinese American girls that want to follow in your footsteps? Why not be, you know what I mean? Like go against all stereotypes. Like she had such an opportunity here to be praised by so many young people. And instead she jumped shit and went over to China of all yeah. places. Not the great. And real quick, the other thing I want to say is, you know, ESPN is getting a lot of flack for 
this and, and rightfully so. But isn't it amazing, Carly, that when it comes to China, what is going on here with China? OK, the Saudi Arabia, there's that live golf tour, right? Mm -hmm. it's, people are freaking out about that. Well, why are people mad about China that ESPN and LeBron and all these people are pandering to China? Is China that much better than Saudi Arabia? I mean, <laughs> I mean, a, yeah, that's, it's a great point there. And uh, Eileen Goose says that she uh, wants to promote the sport she loves in the country of her mother's heritage. So that's her story. She's sticking to it. But I'm sure she made a yeah. lot of money when she decided to make yeah. that decision as well. Also, this uh, Pat Benatar is refusing to sing <sighs> Hit Me With Your Best Shot over gun violence. Sure. Now, she says, quote, fans are having a heart attack. And I'm like, sorry, in deference to the victims of the families of these mass shootings. I'm not singing it. What are your thoughts on this? All right, so obviously Evalde, like a horrible, terrible situation. Nobody condones that. I've gone on Twitter rants about it. I think there was a cover up. You know, the, the, the fact that people haven't stepped down yet, like what is happening there? Okay, so let's put that to the side, though. Pat Benatar, this isn't it, okay? The fact, like, what are you pandering to? What are you doing here? And on top of this, Carly, the song has nothing, nothing to do with guns. I looked it up. I went through the history of it and everything. It's about women empowerment and, uh, you know, uh, overcoming struggles and, and all of that. So she's literally taking a, a, away the, the message behind it for something that it had nothing to do with. And Carly, I tweeted the story out yesterday. You got a ton of reaction on Twitter about it. But my question is this. Because anytime something like this happens, other people try to follow suit. So is there now going to be pressure on, say, Billy Joel? Can he now sing his song Big Shot? Or is he not allowed to? Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi's going to be on the hot seat here. He does the song Shot Through Your Heart. Is he not allowed to do that anymore? Yeah. What about tequila shots? What about tequila shots? Are we not allowed to talk about shots that way? It's, like, what are we doing here? Point. I understand. I understand the noble cause of it, but this ain't it, Pat Benatar. Not at all. Like, do something better. What Come are we on. doing here is a very good question. Mike, thank you so much for joining us this morning. See you guys. Thanks, Carly. You're very welcome. <laughs> See you soon. All right, the Biden administration is letting illegal immigrants use arrest warrants as valid ID to board planes. We'll tell you how many, tick, how many got a one-way ticket with that form of ID. If you're an illegal alien and you have committed a crime, oh, and you have an arrest warrant, come right to the front of the line and get right on the plane. New York Republican gubernatorial candidate and current Congressman Lee Zeldin getting attacked at a campaign stop last night. You can see the man jump on stage while Zeldin was speaking when police say he approaches and begins swinging his sharp weapon toward Zeldin's neck. That terrifying moment was caught on camera. Watch this. There's only one option. The Monroe County Sheriff's Office says the suspected attacker was taken into custody and charged with attempted assault. He was immediately released on his own reconnaissance. Ashley Strohmeyer spoke with eyewitness Cody Crippen, who caught the shocking moment on camera. He says the ambush could have been severe had the right people not been in the crowd. Just the right people were there. A lot of people reacted very quickly and prevented the situation from getting worse because it very easily could. I mean, he he was so close to the guy and, you know, just poking at somebody with a, you know, a weapon like that, it's never a good thing. So I, I think it could have gone horribly wrong. Later in the show, we're going to be talking to AMVETS director Joe Cinelli, who subdued the attacker. And a convicted murderer released just six years into a 50-year sentence is re-arrested on gun and drug charges. Andrew Kachu, who committed the murder as a juvenile, got out of prison early because L.A. County D.A. George Gascon declined to fight to keep him behind bars. Gascon tried to defend that decision, saying, quote, We are disappointed to learn that Mr. Kachu has not availed himself of the support that he so clearly needs and are committed to holding him accountable as an adult in this case. Critics of Gascon's soft on crime policies are working to remove him from office. A recall organizer says uh, they're confident they're gathering enough signatures to put the measure on the November ballot. Two so-called low-risk fentanyl trafficking suspects caught with 150,000 fentanyl pills were no-shows at their court date yesterday. 
One of that, both of them were released on cashless bail by the judge less than 24 hours after being arrested last month in Northern California. At the time, the Tulare County Sheriff expressed outrage that criminal suspects, uh, criminals pushing deadly drugs were able to walk free, and he predicts the suspects would not show for their court date. An escalating war of words between New York City's mayor and a couple of red state governors. The Republican leaders are telling Eric Adams that the Biden administration is to blame for the recent surge of migrants in the Big Apple. Brooke Senior is live with an update on this, Brooke. That's right, guys. The back and forth comes as an influx of migrants in New York City puts a strain on its shelter system. Mayor Adams is once again blaming Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Listen. They sent them away. They sent them out of this state. Our country is home of the free, land of the brave. We do not be co become cowards and send people away to looking, looking for help. Texas and Arizona have launched Governor Abbott's offices denying Adams' accusations that buses are being sent to New York, saying, quote, Mayor Adams should check with President Biden if his administration is the one dumping migrants in his city, as they've been doing to Texas border towns for months. And Arizona's governor tweeting, Mayor Adams really has no clue what's happening at our nation's southern border, saying the real lack of compassion is coming from the Biden administration, who has turned a blind eye. Meanwhile, Republicans on Capitol Hill pressing TSA officials for allowing illegal migrants to use arrest warrants as valid IDs to board airplanes. Watch this. How many individuals have presented TSA with arrest warrants or deportation notices and were permitted to travel in this calendar year? Uh, under a thousand, sir. So we aren't looking at whether a person is legal or illegal in the country. Our, our function is to make sure that... Why not? Because our role is to make sure that uh, people that might pose a risk to transportation um, that's significant enough to either require enhanced screening or to not allow them to fly. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley says it's a slap in the face to law-abiding citizens. Listen. What they're telling us is wait in the longest lines ever, be treated to all kinds of random inspections and invasive procedures and have your stuff confiscated. But if you're an illegal alien and you have committed a crime, oh, and you have an arrest warrant, come right to the front of the line and get right on the plane. But guys, the TSA chief says the presentation of a warrant simply marks the beginning of a further verification process. Carly, Joey. Thanks, Brooke. Unbelievable. Joe joins me now. Good morning, Ian. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Those numbers are not surprising. It's a, it, uh, uh, New Yorkers are voting with their feet in terms of educational school choice. You know, I guess it would be easy to blame this on COVID and say, hey, you know, everything was disrupted, but it feels like there's more to it than that. What can you tell me about it? Well, even prior to COVID, I mean, the New York City Charter School Center back in 2019 said that there were about 81,000 applications for charter school seats, but only 33,000 available seats. You know, so nearly 50,000 uh, families who were desperate for a high quality education. Then on top of that, add what transpired during the pandemic. You mean you had charter schools really spring into action. You know, we set up uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots in housing projects to ensure that kids had access to remote instruction. We had high quality instruction, as well as many charter schools had in-person instruction, obsessed with ensuring that these kids, who are some of the most vulnerable, actually had access to the highest quality education. You know, Phil, this is a New York City problem. I would imagine politics and partisan politics in schools probably isn't the big problem here. It's more nuts and bolts of, of what type of education and the quality of education. Uh, what are charter schools getting right in educating kids that public schools aren't, aren't doing right? Well, first of all, charter schools are public schools. They're just public schools that are privately run, typically by nonprofit organizations. And what charter schools usually get right is that we're offering choice. In the district in which we're launching Vertex Partnership Academies, this international baccalaureate high school, which is an extension of, of uh, other charter school networks, only 7% of students who entered ninth grade four years later are ready for college. Parents have had enough of this kind of performance and they want high quality options. That's why there's so many families who are advocating for eliminating the cap 
that currently exists on charter schools. There are, there are all these incredible entrepreneurs that want to run great schools in low-income communities, uh, serving black and Hispanic kids. Again, our high school will serve almost exclusively low-income kids with a world-class education that you typically is only found in private schools. So generally, parents want choice. They want more high-quality 